Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, for attending our webinar today on BIM for Healthcare. My name is Peter Costanzo. I'm with Imaginet Technologies. I'm going to uh, play host for today along with Lisa, and our keynote speaker in this is going to be Joe Porostowski with The Ohio State University. So for those of us that are here, I just want to talk a little bit about what BIM is. I know uh, most of you probably know that, but ironically, I had a couple people register um, and in the notes said, hey, an outline of what BIM would be helpful. Um, the second thing we're going to talk about is, you know, what the benefits are for owners. And the best way I could quantify this is if you went out and you bought a lottery ticket and you needed the five numbers to win. Um, where BIM is being used right now in terms of the true ROI that you can get for it, people are only picking the first couple numbers. So it's like having all five, you know, uh, numbers on your lottery ticket and only getting two because you're not real, uh, only cashing it in for two because you're not realizing the value. Um, then after that, Joe's going to talk about what they did at their initiative um, at OSU. And we're going to talk a little bit about how um, we might be able to help here at Imagine It, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, so, what is BIM? There are all sorts of different terms for BIM, and for this specifically, and I'm opening it up now so I can look at it, I went to Wikipedia, you know, because that should be the source of everything. And Wikipedia was uh, very amorphous in their, their answer. It's uh, building information modeling, BIM, is a process supported by various tools, technologies, contracts, and contracts involving the generation and management of digital representations of physical and functional characteristics and places. And it goes on, and it's very wordy like that. Um, and I find that um, a lot of people that I talk to, there are a lot of misconceptions about BIM, and I like that statement because it's kind of wordy and vague, leaving it open in different areas. Um, all BIM is really is information in some type of data format um, about a building. And as you look at a building or a structure, there are different ways to look at it. So you could look at it from an architect's perspective, you know, what's the design and function. Um, you know, structural engineers, it's, you know, the perception of how, you know, we'll look at this structurally. MEP is uh, wonderful because uh, historically, uh, MEP and structural, we know all that the pipes during construction tend to uh, want to uh, be uh, set up to go right through a column that someone's put up. Um, and then things are built and then it's managed by owners. But as we look at it in an information age, all we're really talking about is BIM is the whole concept of having um, different data about a facility. And again, as I look at it, it could be at different levels for different groups as I kind of talked about that. As we look at a life cycle, and I kind of used the example um, before, uh, you know, of only cashing in part of the numbers when you had all of the numbers on a lottery ticket, um, BIM is being used very heavily by the design and construction company organizations in terms of planning and design and building. Um, the irony is the real value in this is in um, the management of the building. Um, design, construction, and planning happens in a very short period of time, and buildings are going to be managed for a long period of time, particularly when they're healthcare buildings. Um, generally, you don't put up a hospital and, and tend to flip it like corporate real estate. It's something that's going to be there uh, for a while. Um, and as I talk about BIM, um, one other example I want to give um, helping about this is um, um, what you're, you're able to do is get away from the paper-based world that you are. And as you have information about things, there's a simple concept in IT that algorithms are written to help do things. And I'll give some examples of that in uh, planning, design, and construction. But things that, that data can be used in facilities over the life cycle of a building. So as you look about BIM, um, another thing to note that is there are different um, things that we'll, we'll talk about BIM. So Autodesk has a tool called Revit, um, which will create a building information model or a BIM. Um, and that is a piece of technology. BIM itself is all about a process. So it's about the level of data um, about that facility and, or that building. Also, as we talk about it, BIM doesn't necessarily mean Revit. Um, data about a facility could exist in Revit. Um, it could exist during the commissioning phase. Someone could be, you know, putting barcodes on a piece of equipment and um, keeping track of that in a, you know, simple Excel table. 
and uh, importing that into some repository. That's BIM as well. So as you look at successfully implementing BIM, part of it is where does the data come in? And it becomes part of a much bigger process. It's not just looking at, you know, where you are architecturally. The second thing is different sizes fit for different groups. It's not one size fits all. Um, so when Joe talks very specifically about what OSU um, has done, he'll talk not only about why they did what they did and where they're looking to go. So as you go, this is part of a journey, and I kind of specified the end there, that you're developing your roadmap for your facility. Um, and as I talk to different institutions about, hey, what level of information should be in my model, the answer is, well, I don't know. Um, because it's not one size fits all. So you can look at guidelines for different organizations, but as you look at the data that you're going to have in your models, you're going to think about that in terms of retrospect about, hey, is the data worth having as I put it in my model and maintaining so that it can give me value in different areas? Um, so just talking about a couple benefits to owners from a BIM perspective. So there are, um, elements, you know, from a design and construction perspective, but I'm kind of looking at these as I talk about them more from an, you know, an end user perspective. Some nice things that you're able to do is um, start to get together, you know, different data, do your planning, and start looking at um, how your facility is going to work. As we move into a 3D and augmented reality world, there's going to be more and more an experience for people to experience what things will like, look like pre-construction. So even um, as you're working from a, you know, a design and construction standpoint, um, things are being used to, to model this. You might, as a facility manager, look at this more like, hey, what's, you know, the layout of a room going to look like? Or how can I work to make, you know, an OR room, for example, um, work more effectively with a layout? From a design phase, I kind of mentioned earlier that IT has the simple rule, if you get good data, you're going to create good algorithms. Um, so as the design and construction industry is using BIM, they're able to start to do that type of analysis. So there's a lot done around energy analysis, for example, right? And there are different ways we can look at energy. We can pull the daylighting studies into that to say, hey, how many lights do we need? Um, you also can start looking more as you have models at things like, you know, patient, staff, and comfort and efficiency. If you've got a 3D model, you could do a walkthrough. And while you're thinking about, you know, the function of the hospital, at the end of the day, you're, you're looking to serve a specific patient. Um, you can also do other interesting things very quickly. And the screen that I have on the side um, is kind of um, what was highlighted. This part of the demo for another project where we clicked on a piece of equipment on the roof, and it showed in blue all the rooms that would be affected um, that had the same HVAC system. And we were looking at a lab situation if something needed to be shut down. I also like this slide because I make fun of it. Um, I have an 11-year-old son who's into Legos, and these pieces of equipment up here look awfully like Legos to me. Um, so as we talk about, um, I talked earlier, levels of data and what you need, um, one thing to think about. And two, you know, how important is um, this piece of information? And Joe will talk a little bit about um, what uh, content um, in his part of the presentation was kind of leading up to. In construction, um, there have been one of the biggest gains have been, so I mentioned before, you know, historically, you didn't have the structural engineers having discussions with the guys running the HVAC, and things tend to um, clash. So from clash detection alone, um, where you can take uh, from BIM several models and lay them on top of each other, and you can say, hey, this is where I'm going to have a problem, um, they're, they're tremendous savings. When I talked before about that concept of having a lottery ticket and only having a couple numbers, uh, another metaphor I'd like to get you, for you, you know, um, if, if you, um, most people have seen Jerry Maguire or heard about the scene in Jerry Maguire where um, he's screaming, show me the money, and he's jumping up and down in the office screaming, show me the money, and it shows the window from the outside, and people are looking at this guy thinking that he's crazy. The money for BIM is... Um, truly in the operational area. Um, and 
depending on which studies you look to, it's any from 60% um, to 100% of the values. It's a big gap, but there's some very simple things. Um, so in a CAD-based world for healthcare, most of you are probably polylining your um, drawings in order to gather your Medicaid and Medicare reporting data. Um, from a space use perspective, there is no polylining if you have things in a building information model. Um, you're able to look at things in kind of 3D, um, which improves decision making. Um, the other thing, as we talk about what's in a building information model, you can have not only that, hey, these are my walls and my doors and my room, but here are the pieces of equipment. Um, here's detailed data on the pieces of equipment. Um, so that day one, you can have that data sunk up with your maintenance management system, and you don't realize a year into the building uh, life that, you know, filters haven't been changed that should have been changed three months ago um, because you're ready to go day one. Um, Lisa works with me to find a slide that I talk a lot in the area of space and work and asset management, and I ask her to get a slide to say, hey, how else are other, you know, ways that BIM could be used? So this is not a traditional slide I use, but outside of, you know, in the life cycle of the building, there's a whole bunch of areas that things can be done. The other thing I wanted to point out at the bottom, I kind of have math and I have that um, in quotes. Um, I've been doing some uh, work recently with mapping integration and BIM and um, the level at which we are with our smart devices that we're walking around with. There's a reason why your iPhone costs a lot of money or your Samsung device costs a lot of money or your Android device costs a lot of money. That device um, has a, a lot of power in it. One of the things you can do, we're at the point technologically today um, where um, Apple had, for example, rolled out a program, an indoor mapping program, where externally you can work with your Apple device and see where you are. And then internally, um, there's a way to show you um, throughout a building. Um, and uh, if you're an Apple person and you're into to maps, next time you're in a major airport, turn on your device, it'll show where you are. Um, but I always laugh, um, I've been calling on hospitals for 15 years, I am an expert at getting lost in, in hospitals um, as I'm looking you know, for facilities laughingly. Um, but wayfinding and all sorts of other benefits, you're gonna start to come out. And I point back to that, hey, you know, look at the money, look at the data, look where you're moving forward. As the technology is evolving rapidly around us, it's evolving rapidly in facilities. And the goal is to kind of harness that information to make better decisions. So I hope that was a, a kind of good introduction for BIM. Um, I'd like to hand things over to Joe Porstosky, um, who's going to talk about what um, OSU did for their BIM initiative and kind of walk you through their story. Existing buildings and how we've utilized that uh, in, our, <clears throat> in our organization. And we kind of have wrapped this entire, all of our BIM initiatives into one, uh, one or initiative, I should say, called the Buckeye BIM initiative. And it really has three different parts. And the first part, which we started first uh, sequentially was BIM for existing buildings. And I wanna talk primarily about that. But in addition to that, we've been doing a lot of work around BIM for design and construction. For us, this looked, it looks like developing a project, uh, a BIM project delivery standard where we actually have some requirements around what types of BIM use cases that projects need to use when they're doing work at Ohio State uh, but also really focuses on the deliverables we receive at the end of a project. And I'm not going to talk a lot about that uh, t during today's talk, but we've seen a lot of the value that Peter already mentioned during design and construction because of our requirements around use of BIM. And we've seen a lot of value in those deliverables that we get at the end of a project because we have all this rich data that we can use then to operate our facilities. And we're really trying to move then to this area of BIM for operations. How do we take all this great data that we receive from projects? How do we take all this great data that we're developing for our existing facilities? And how do we then bring that to the actual frontline workers who need to interact with our buildings on a day-to-day -day basis and make decisions? And so we kind of like to think about this in a little bit of a, uh, uh, in a, uh, in these three areas of build, we're building these existing models of existing facilities. We're maintaining those 
models over time as things change. We're integrating data from the design and construction process. Now, one of the big things that I, I want you to understand about why we even try, started this initiative with BIM was we wanted to help the organization make better decisions more quickly. We say that all the time when we're talking about what we're doing with BIM. It's really about helping in many different ways the organization figure out how to make better decisions and make those better decisions more quickly. And we found that BIM has enabled that in a lot of ways around our physical space. Now, this has not been an overnight success. I've been working on this for quite some time. It was back in 2008, 2009 that we started thinking about what BIM might do for us, for, exi for our existing facilities, and started to talk with a uh, you know, consultant that took us under his wing and uh, was giving us some advice about what it might be able to do, uh, a very BIM-savvy BIM organization that he was part of. And that led us into 2010 in, in hiring a student and saying, hey, go build us a model. We didn't know what we were talking about. We didn't even know what we were asking, really. But we said, go build one, and let's see what it does, what it can do. Uh, and we used that model, that one model of a very simple building we had on campus in the Med Center to then advocate for some funding. And we began, we began by converting our medical center uh, from AutoCAD into Revit, about 6 million square feet. And that started in 2011, where once we received some funding to do this, we really began talking through how do we, how do, we do this? What's the kind of standards we want to have? And I'll talk more about that in a moment. And then led into completing the Med Center and continuing on with the rest of our university. Uh, and then eventually uh, talking about how we could then require BIM to be used on, on projects, as I've already mentioned, in 2012, where we started the majority of that work. To date, we've been working on this for almost nine years. We are almost 90% of the way complete. Uh, as of, um, as, actually, as of today, we are at the 418 buildings. Uh, we've published two more buildings today. It's a little over 33 million square feet that we now have in Revit. Uh, we probably think it's going to take about another two, maybe three years to get that last 10%. We're down to some of the difficult last buildings that are small, and small buildings sometimes take longer than big buildings in a per square foot perspective. Um, but we are, we're, we're getting there, and we'll have probably around 37 million square feet by the time we're done, um, because new buildings are going to probably come online during that time, too. One of the big ideas, though, that we had to think through and, and really develop around when we first started this whole project was this idea of an owner's model. And during the process of, of building, designing and building buildings, you have all sorts of different types of models. You have your design intent models, then your work intents, your as-builts. We like to call our owner's model the as-maintained model. So we're going to maintain over the life of a building. And so internally, we call it the owner's model. But we had to ask ourselves a lot of questions. We had this opportunity at the beginning of the project to, to think about what we want to model. Uh, sure, we had certain things that we had been doing in AutoCAD all along. Do we want to do those things? Do we want to continue to bring that data into Revit? Or is there more things that we want to add into Revit? And that's just the two-dimensional type aspects. Obviously, there's going to be lots of additional types of data that's going to come in a model that we didn't have in a 2D drawing. So we had to ask a lot of questions. What do we need? What do we not need? And we went to a lot of our customers internally and said, hey, what would be most valuable to you? And really, the underlying question at the beginning of this was, what supports our planning efforts? At the time, and even today, we still sit under the planning side of the house at Ohio State. We do support the operations side of the house much more than we did back then. But when we were talking about these models at the very beginning, it was around what do we do to support planning? Now, if you ask enough people what they want in the models, you're going you're gonna to build the whole building down to every nut and bolt because everyone's got a different thing that they want. But we, we had to think about what had the biggest ROI, what was going to give us the most, most value if we modeled it. Uh, and so those questions about what do we need, what do we not need, uh, drove us to develop our current iteration of the owner's model. We also had to answer what can be reasonably maintained. We, I only have a certain amount of staff, and we don't want to just build something and then not be able to maintain it for the long term. That doesn't have a lot of value. And I think that's one of the things that trips people up sometimes. They can find maybe a uh, funding or some labor to build these models, but they haven't really thought through how they're going to maintain them. And especially in our context, especially within the medical center at Ohio State, 
the rate of churn is so high that if the, the models become out of date pretty quickly if you don't have a sufficient amount of resources allocated to actually maintain those models. So it's really important to us that we knew we had a way of maintaining those models uh, for the long term before we started building anything. But what did that mean for us? It ended up being uh, these pieces of information. This is what we said we were going to model as part of our base model. And it included a lot of detail about walls, windows, and doors, and things like column grids and columns, but not as much about casework. It had certain types of casework in certain places and not in others. We had basic plumbing fixtures. and So these are the things that we decided we were going to have in our base, our base model. And we were very careful as we went through this project to stick to it. We use a lot of students for modeling, and they would get really excited. They'd go out in the field and say, oh, I can model this, this, and this. And we had to say, no, 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 just stick with what we're, we've agreed to do. At our scope, uh, the problem is that if you keep adding different things, you're just never going to get the project done. And so we had to say, this for now is what we're going to focus on. Now, we did have several other types of buildings where we would add additional information. For instance, residence halls had some additional furniture, uh, and certain athletic facilities have different uh, types of things we modeled. But even then, we wrote, we, we have a very strict scope of what we're going to actually put in those buildings, and we, stri we stay very, uh, very close to that. We don't, we don't adjust it for any reason. The other type of model we have is an additional model development, we call, which is taking everything that's in this base model and adding a, some additional information to it. Again, very, there's, there's, there's nice walls around that of what, we're gonna, what we do. Primarily, that's used from when we receive projects through the design and construction process. Because we don't need to model those from scratch, um, we, uh, we basically say that we're going to maintain all the information in this model it's either in our base model, this list you see here, or in our additional model development list. And so that's, and we keep, that's our list. We don't try to go beyond that. But we really had to think through as an organization, again, what was valuable to us from a planning perspective? And once we got into getting buildings in through the design and construction process, what was valuable to us from an operational standpoint? And saying these are the things that we're going to maintain over the long term. So you've learned a lot of lessons, and this is really where I want to uh, share with you some of the things that we learned along the way, things that we've been over the last nine years, uh, maybe some of the mistakes we've made. And really what it comes down to is we're coming at this from the perspective of a single owner, and that single owner has a lot of buildings, uh, and we're going to maintain those for a long time. And I want to make this clear, when you compare what we, how we approach BIM as compared to, say, an architectural engineering firm, a construction firm, they're only living with those models that they developed for a couple of years. And so, you know, they can, they can model a certain way, they can have certain conventions, uh, and they can have definitely a certain uh, company-wide standards, but they don't have to live with it forever. They can kind of continually adjust those things, and a couple years after a building has been started, they can throw that model away and they're onto the next project. For us, we have to live with these models for a very long time. Uh, until the next thing after Revit. And for us, we have, as I already mentioned, about 420 buildings that have been completed already. That also includes buildings that have come in through the design and construction that our total model count with those, those buildings, which may have five, six, seven models as part of them, we're well over 500 total models. And we have to maintain those over the long term, which has really caused us to have to rethink through certain things, which I'll, I'll share a couple of those now. The first thing that we've learned, though, is this idea of proper planning and focus. Focus, as I already mentioned, we had to think about what needed to be modeled. And that's important up front if you're going to go down this route of thinking about BIM for your existing facilities, and really even for if you're going to put standards around what gets delivered to you. What do you care about? What's important to you as an organization? What are you really going to actually use for planning and operations? And, and finding out those pieces of information that are most useful to you. Again, what can you maintain? It's not helpful if you, can, if you ask for the, all this or develop all these things, but then a year later it's incorrect. How are you going to maintain it? What is your plan around that? What has the best ROI for the organization? It's not about asking for everything. It's about asking for the things that make the most sense, and that's the focus piece of this. Focus in on the things that are most important to you as, a, as, a, as, a, as an owner. And uh, it's going to be different for you than it was for us. And you just have to kind of think through then for the types of uses I plan to use this for, what is going to have the most value to my organization. But also training. We, we use students to do a lot of our modeling. 
And so we have to have well-developed and documented processes. Now I'd argue that even if you don't have students, if you have staff, you want to have good, well-developed processes. This is because you really want every building to look the same. And I'm going to talk a little more about standardization here in just a second, but you want every model to look and act the same. And so if you have a, a consistent process that you, you're using for every model, you're going to have that outcome. And so you have to have that good onboarding and training of modelers, whether you're using staff or they're using some students like we do. Then also, we want our models to be used more broadly. We don't want them just to be used for, for our, our team here that, that manages space, manages our, our data about our facilities. We want, we want lots of different users throughout the university to be able to use these models in their daily work. And so we conduct um, continual training throughout the year. We always have several trainings a year, one-day trainings on Revit Basics. We have usually one training, which is a two-day training on more advanced topics within Revit. Uh, and we have an, even an AutoCAD training uh, class for those who want to stick with 2D. But we want to make sure our users are, are, are well-trained in how to use the tools. In addition, we want to continually improve this process. One of the things that we, we've learned a lot through for over the last nine years, we started off with a particular process, and that process has not been wholesale change, but we have tweaked that a lot as we've learned new things, as we've made mistakes, as we've realized one thing or another didn't work. We've adjusted that process over time. We've also adjusted our templates over time to improve the functionality of of how we interact with the model. But we want every model to be the same. So one of the challenges we had is when we finished the Med Center and we moved on to the rest of campus, about a year into that, we realized we'd learned a lot of lessons about modeling the Med Center, about modeling those first couple of buildings and the rest of campus. Whereas we had changed the templates so much that we actually had to go back into the Med Center buildings and update them all. Now, I'm gonna tell you that we're not gonna do that again. It was a pretty painful process. Um, we feel pretty confident on where our templates are, where our processes are today. But we wanted to make sure all of our models were consistent. And that continual pro improvement process got us to a point where we feel really good about where our template is today, where our processes are today. And that also includes our families. How do we develop families? Are, you know, we've, we really worked through this idea of what is a, are we going to make this a buildable family or is it going to be representational? We focused more on representational. We wanted parametric families so we can limit the number of families we have but give mo the most flexibility we could. And we wanted to make sure they looked good two-dimensionally because a lot we understand that at the end of the day, a lot of the systems that consume our data uh, are still are still within 2D, and that's okay. And so we want to make sure that things look good two-dimensionally. And so we focus on lightweight families that look good two-dimensionally, have value to us, uh, they have the maximum value to us as an organization. And so we've continually improved that over the years. But part of that continual improvement is this idea of standardization. Our process is standardized. Our template is standardized. Our family naming convention and the way we build our families is standardized. Our naming conventions are standardized. It's, it's very important at this scale, when we're talking about this many buildings and this many square feet, you can very easily start getting just completely bogged down with the challenges of managing that much square footage in Revit. And we have found that maintaining uh, a strict adherence to standards in many of these areas has really simplified the process of managing, managing our organization and managing all the data because it has allowed us to automate. And in a lot of ways, the automation has really what saved us uh, at this level. Uh, first was model checking software. When we first started this process of building these models in the Med Center, we would do a visual audit of the students' work, making sure they conformed to the standards and felt, fo followed the process and they did good modeling habits. But it took two to three days to do a single audit of a building, of an average sized building. And honestly, that was pretty error prone. You just can't catch everything visually. So when we moved out of the Med Center and onto the rest of the university, we employed Celebri as an IFC based model checker. And that really was a huge benefit to us. Uh, it, it allowed us to check a lot of things we weren't checking before and allow us to automate a lot of those checks and reduce that, that model checking time down from two to three days to, on average, one, uh, a single day for the entire audit process for a model. Uh, and um, obviously, there were still some things we needed to check manually, but it, it really improved the quality of our models. And again, we went back into then the, the Med Center models and ran, the, ran those checks on there, too, and improved the quality of those models. And then a couple of years ago, we, we also added the Revit Model Checker, which is a tool from Autodesk. And it checked all the things, it checked, it checked a number of things that the IFC-based Libri model checker couldn't check. And so we were able to reduce, again, the time from about a day to between two and four hours per model, 
uh, to, to for the entire audit process for an average size building. That's been a game changer. It's allowed us to hire more students per year to do the modeling process so we can keep our pace up um, and keep our quality up at the same time. Uh, we also do a lot of things. We automate our family management and the way we share that, and that's that's been a huge benefit. But we also developed a lot of plugins over the over over the years. And um, for us, Imagine has actually been a partner for us in developing these these plugins. And these came out of our need as we went to simplify our process, reduce error, and reduce time. Things like we have an, a consistent space ID for all of our spaces across campus. And so instead of hand typing that in, which we were doing before, and it was very error prone and very time consuming. We, we had a tool created that would populate that information using the room number, the floor number, and the building number. Cube space tools related to that when we break down a space below uh, uh, further into say cubes or lab benches. We, made it, we created a sheet creator tool that allowed us to rapidly create the sheets based on one, one uh, created sheet. So create one sheet, make it look the way we want. Now we can create the rest of the, uh, all the rest of the sheets we need from that one. Again, reduces air, speeds up our time. Closeout automation has been huge, hugely helpful to us once we get these buildings into the maintenance workflow. Uh, changes are always happening, and every time a change occurs, we have got to push out DWFs and DWGs and, and uh, PDFs and all these different files, and they all have to go somewhere different. And, and instead of forgetting those or spending a lot of time remembering which, what do I need to do, uh, which view template am I applying to this particular export, this closeout automation does it all for us, simplifies that process, speeds it up, reduces error. I would say though the biggest one for us is the file archiver updater. And for us, one of the biggest challenges now, time-wise, is trying to keep the Revit models updated every year as their versions change. And there's no easy way to do this when you're dealing with as many files as we are. Um, there is a tool from Autodesk like this bulk up, uploader, or, I'm sorry, up, updater tool. It doesn't really work well in our context. So we built this file archiver updater, which archives the existing copy of the model, and then does the update process and, and, and deals with suppressing a lot of the warnings that we see when you typically do upgrades that don't affect us, doing some error checking as it goes. This process right now, if we were to use complete man hours, probably would take us about a month, month and a half to complete every year. Instead, using the file archiver updater, you can, we can usually knock it out in about three different evenings, so maybe an hour or two of total labor time. Game changer for us, really saved the project. The amount of labor we'd spend just updating every year would probably would made, made it a little bit challenging to continue. And so this has been, that, was a, that was a big deal for us. And then we have a couple there, view and sheet deleter, imported line pattern de deleter that are specifically for bringing models in from the design and construction process, cleaning them up so we can get them into our standard and into our environment. One of the last big things, though, lessons that we've learned is this idea of partnering and collaborating. Early on, we wanted to make sure that we were partnering internally and making sure that all of our customers, uh, their voices were heard. What do you need? What do you want? This applies to BIM for existing buildings and also for our work in developing our BIM project delivery standard. What do you need? What is going to be helpful to you? Uh, if we're going to go through this process, we want it to be the mo have the most benefit to the university as, as, as we can and making sure we're doing that. And not only then, is that continued collaboration with our internal stakeholders, helping them to learn the tools, as I already mentioned, and hearing their feedback on what's working and what's not working. But also externally, and we've worked with a number of just very excellent consultants and partners over the last nine, 10 years of this project, people who have really lent their expertise to us, um, that they've filled in those knowledge gaps. We couldn't possibly have known enough about Revit or BIM. We didn't know anything about those topics, to be honest, when we started this project. We had to bring in people who knew how Revit worked and what were the, what's gonna, what, 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 where areas are you going to have trouble with and what do you need to think about and uh, how to build a model effectively and what's the right way to do that and how to advance then that over the long term and start developing these software plugins and, and thinking about what industry best standards are around project delivery standards. The, our, our great partners really have assisted us in becoming really a BIM-centric and BIM-savvy organization, um, but we needed that external partner to really get to where we are today. Now, one of the things that we're, all, we're trying to aim for is this, this idea of really utilizing this, this data to its fullest benefit within operations. As Peter already mentioned, that's where the money is, and we feel like that too. But it's also kind of the hardest piece. Uh, it's it's the area that's the least mature, especially from a technological perspective, and the processes aren't aren't all there yet. And so we've been working 
continually working on this idea of getting to this point, this, this utopia that I show you in the slide here, of having these models, these in Revit models, they are their databases with a drawing component. And so how do you take that, 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 that model you have, that database, and begin linking it to all sorts of other systems within your organization, from your space system and GIS to your asset management work order to your automation systems? How do you bring all that information into one place, one home, potentially on a tablet, that you can then give to your frontline workers, that they can actually make decisions more quickly in the field? Uh, and that's where we're headed. And there's definitely technology solutions out there today um, that are continuing to mature and that we continue to dabble with. Uh, but this is where we're headed. We want to be able to take all this great data from our design and construction process, take all this great data we have housed in other systems and from all the models that we're building from scratch and expose this to the wider organization. And so we continue to work through solutions uh, to get to this, uh, this end. Um, and over the next couple of years, we, we intend to make a lot more progress in this area. So I'm going to switch it back to Peter. Sorry, it took me a minute to hit my uh, unmute button. Unmute button there. Um, so um, imagine it uh, working in conjunction with um, Joe and his team at OSU um, have put together a, a package to help organizations um, move their existing facilities that they're interested into um, from a 2D world into BIM. And uh, it's called BIM Switch, and basically uh, it's got three main pieces to it. It's a process, you know, running through how um, you would put together your models and uh, set of checks and balances as you go along the process to make sure that things are done correctly. Um, Joe talked a lot before about content, um, and it comes with a content library that's very lightweight um, and usable. And um, content is an important thing to think about when you think about models, because models get very large. Um, and in the concept of building an information model, I like Joe's last slide where he talks about all the different systems they're looking to integrate with. And um, if you ever notice, every software vendor that you talk to thinks that their software is the center of the world. So I had uh, an Archibus um, pre-sales engineer. They're a facility management system we work with, and uh, an Autodesk pre-sales engineer in the room once, and we were talking about um, what should be in a Revit model and where information should be about a piece of equipment. Um, and the guy from Autodesk argued that, well, all of the information be, should be inside the model. Um, and the guy from Archibus um, argued that all of the details should be inside of um, uh, Archibus. And as you look at it, um, what you really need to create when there's a system integration is a link between two things. Um, so the content library that we put together here is very lightweight to able to visually represent what something is. Um, and make um, so, and then the details about that piece of information are in the maintenance management system or asset management system or other systems that you have um, so your models are easier to work with. And then the third component, which Joe kind of talked about in detail, are uh, a list of productivity tools to kind of help automate this process as you go through your BIM journey. Um, we also uh, have something which we call a BIM for Owner Smart Start, which is kind of a plan to get you there. And um, I don't know what building this famous picture is from on the right-hand side, but um, and I can't get over. I'm terrified of heights, the fact that they're all eating up there, sitting, eating lunch. Um, but that skyline is still there. So when they were building this building, um, you know, they never thought of all the things that would happen. So as you start to look at your BIM standard, um, there's a concept of, hey, where am I today and where do I want to be tomorrow? Um, and I go back to that process thing that I talked about. It's uh, much more of a journey than, the, than anything. Joe talked in detail um, a little bit when he showed his roadmap, you know, of different systems that they want to integrate. As um, IoT and technology continue to evolve, there's going to be a tremendous amount of use cases for having different types of sensors in different places um, as you think about that. And um, one of the things that uh, Building Information Model provides is a spatial roadmap for that, um, even if you're just looking at a basic space model. Um, 
The other thing we have is uh, we leverage both our tools and uh, industry tools, so not covered on this webinar. Um, if you're interested in doing more research on, you know, BIM and how to implement it, there's something called COBE you should take a look up, which stands for Construction Operations Building Information Exchange. And basically, it's a data format um, for that, that BIM integration. Um, and the, the last thing I kind of want to leave you with this, um, most of you, if you're here, if you're not using BIM today, you're probably doing new construction, and you're probably working with firms that have very rich models um, of your facilities. And one of my comments is, you know, make sure you get your ROI, as that you're walking, if you can integrate for your new construction BIM within your process. When I mentioned before, you have that lottery number, You've got all five numbers, and design and construction only gets like, you know, you're only cashing in the first two. Um, but what you want to do is make sure that you figure a way to incorporate that into your process because, um, like I mentioned before, generally you, you don't build a healthcare facility in order to flip it. Um, you build it there to be there for a period of time. 